Most people remember Howard Hughes as an eccentric billionaire recluse. And yet he was once a towering figure in aviation and entertainment whose adventures made him the envy of an entire generation. Oh, he was only tall, dark and handsome, gorgeous. Um, he uh, was fascinating. He had a great sense of humor. There's a truth that you lost your antenna last night. <laughs> the thing that was closest to his heart were airplanes, either building airplanes, designing airplanes, or buying companies that had lots of airplanes. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. He was trying to uh, get a seamless bra, which they did not have in those days, and he was ahead of his time, as usual. I, when I, once I found out what he wanted, I uh, threw the thing under the bed and put on my own bra and put Kleenex over the top of it and put the blouse back on. The wardrobe girl was having a fit. She says, I'm going to get fired. And I said, forget it. They won't ever know the difference. And we went out and did it. On one occasion, he saw a CBS report that called uh, him, called Howard a uh, millionaire. And he wrote this long memo to Mayhew instructing him to put out the word that he was a billionaire, not a millionaire. And he didn't want to be put into this reduced class. His life ended in tragic isolation and madness, but Howard Hughes was and remains an American original. Howard Hughes was born on Christmas Eve, 1905, in Houston, Texas. The biggest oil boom in American history was underway at this time. Hughes' father, a lawyer turned wildcatter, was often away from home. He didn't strike it rich in the ground, but his inventive mind made the family fortune anyway. Hughes Sr. designed and manufactured a drilling bit nicknamed the Rock Eater that became the tool of choice for oil men around the world. At home, young Howard's mother doted on her only child and watched over his health, forever worried that he would be exposed to harmful germs. I think his mother felt overprotective because, first of all, she was an anxious person herself, Second, she could never have another child, and she felt terribly uh, protective of him for fear of possibly losing him. He soon found that by getting sick, he could avoid social contacts and thus reduce his anxiety. So as he got older, he never had a tendency to, uh, to break that because it served some valuable purposes for him. He felt uneasy, he got sick, he got out of the situation that made him uneasy and relaxed him a little bit so that that encouraged the getting sick any time he was in difficulty. Howard's early health problems included deafness and at age 13, an apparent bout with polio. Sent away to prep school in California, the shy boy and so-so student became interested in movie making from an uncle who was a screenwriter. While he was at school, his mother died of complications from minor surgery, and two years later in 1924, he lost his father to a heart attack. Although he was only 19, Hughes moved swiftly to establish sole ownership of the lucrative Hughes tool business. His backbone and his independence came as a surprise to relatives and to company executives alike. In 1925, Hughes married Ella Rice of the socially prominent Houston family which founded Rice University, and the couple moved to Los Angeles. There, funded by earnings from the tool company, Hughes began producing movies, learning on the job and learning fast. A silent film called Everybody's Acting was his first release. Then he made a comedy that actually won an Oscar, Two Arabian Nights. As he planned his 1927 hit movie about World War I airmen, no detail was too small to escape his notice. And when he cast unknown Harleen Carpenter, he introduced America to Gene Harlow. Would you be shocked if I put on something more comfortable? A pattern of control emerged in the making of Hell's Angels that stayed with Hughes. Raymond Fowler was the psychologist called in during litigation proceedings after his death. He really had to control every aspect from the editing, uh, from the filming, from the story. It, he was so concerned with details on Hell's Angels 
that he actually purchased uh, many, many airplanes. I remember it, someone estimated that he personally had the uh, fourth largest air force in the world <laughs> just to uh, develop that, uh, just to produce that one movie. And he was so involved in every aspect of it that he almost ruined it as he did most of the things that he tried to control. Hughes' marriage went up in smoke in 1929 when Ella Rice divorced him. He was too busy bringing his first Broadway play to the screen with some lines that echoed his own hypochondria. I just had an interview with Williams over in that death house. That jail, that jail is reeking with germs. In 1931, Hughes cast a young Spencer Tracy in another movie about aviation. He gave the female lead to Billy Dove, a former Ziegfeld Follies girl and the new infatuation. Hughes had a genius for publicity. When a movie he made about gangster Al Capone in 1932 was criticized for being too violent, he took the censors to court and won the case for free expression. The real winner was the movie at the box office. It introduced stage actor Paul Muni as Scarface and secured the reputation of Howard Hughes as a force to be reckoned with. Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic in 1927, and Howard Hughes was soon caught up in the excitement and the danger of the aviation era. Using a pseudonym, he was hired on as a junior pilot with American Airlines, but was discovered after only one flight and shown the door. To executive Noah Dietrich, Hughes now handed over day-to-day -day operations of the tool company. This left Howard more time to pursue aspiring actresses like Ginger Rogers, who once recalled the complexity of the man she had dated. I could tell how resentful he was of anyone coming close to us in con conversation. He resented it very much, and he just wouldn't, he wouldn't hold still for somebody walking up to the table and saying, hello, Ginger, how are you? He'd say, who is that? Hughes arranged to meet Catherine Hepburn by landing his plane on the golf course where she was playing. During the three years they were together, Hughes taught Kate how to fly as both fended off the inevitable rumors and gossip about them. Studios labeled Hepburn box office poison at the time, and then Hughes bought the film rights to The Philadelphia Story, the classic comedy that established her as a star once and for all. Hepburn once recalled why she and Hughes could never hit it off as man and wife. They had the same character flaw, she decided, a wild desire to be famous. everything that it takes to make a lovely woman except the one essential, an understanding heart. A&E's biography will continue. Howard Hughes drew national attention when he set a new world flying record, but the flight ended in his first brush with death. This peak field is not a very appropriate setting for this little airplane, which is the new holder of the world's land plane speed record. Its uh, first landing here was caused by motor failure. I looked about and decided this field was the best spot. Put the plane down here with the retractable landing gear retracted as landings in rough country are safer with the wheels up. There was a reckless side to his courage in planes or in automobiles. He went to court for hitting and killing a pedestrian with his car, but it was ruled an accident. Over a period of 10 years, he was badly injured on numerous occasions, often to his head. Uh, I'd say uh, six or eight times within a 10-year period, he had head injuries, some of which led to unconsciousness. I feel pretty sure that the injuries that he had caused an increasing detriment in his functioning and also caused him to have other accidents. How does it feel to go hurtling through space at 290 miles an hour? Well, at 18,000 feet, there's not much sensation. You're so far above the Earth. Are you uh, going to fly this plane back to the coast? Not right away, anyway. Uh, do you intend to break any more records? I'm not sure. Why did you make the plane? What, what kick do you get out of this? Oh, hell, now that question wasn't it. <laughs> In 1936, you set two more records, cutting the flying time between major U.S. cities and pioneering the concept of commercial aviation. The next year, in his H-1, he broke his own transcontinental record, flying from Los Angeles to Newark in the then amazing time of seven hours and 28 minutes. 
He left Burbank, California in the summer of 1938 for what would be his grandest flying adventure. This was the attempt to fly around the world in his Lockheed 14. Howard, what are your plans for the flight? We hope to get away in a week or two and fly to Paris. Are you uh, going to fly alone? No, there'll be five of us. Hughes and his crew started on the first leg of the trip with the New York World's Fair logo for good luck. From New York to Paris, it would take 16 hours and 38 minutes, an astonishing feat, cutting in half the time of Lindbergh's historic flight. The unconventional Hughes seldom dressed like a pilot, but the French still greeted him as the world's foremost aviator. From Paris, Hughes flew to Moscow and then across Siberia, where he nearly crashed into the side of a mountain incorrectly located on the map. There were also pleasant surprises along the way. So much is made over Lindbergh flying the Atlantic, as well as it should be, but not near as much is made over Howard Hughes, who flew around the world. He flew in over the Himalayas into, to, to, into Tibet, and uh, no news ever got into Tibet. Those people were, it was like uh, Shangri-La. I mean, they had no contact with the outside world, and yet for weeks, People had been coming out of the mountains in caravans, on foot, on yaks, gathering to where he landed his plane. And no one knows to this day how they ever knew, how, because for weeks ahead it was just like the coming of Christ, the way they knew that he was coming, this bird out of the sky. The next leg of the flight took Hughes to Fairbanks, Alaska, and then back into the continental United States. When he reached New York on July 14th, landing at Floyd Bennett Field, he established the new around-the-world record of three days, 19 hours, and 28 minutes. Congratulations, welcome home. Mayor LaGuardia led millions of Americans in lionizing the pilot, the hero out of one of his own movies, larger than life and yet modest. But there was nothing modest about his next step, buying two regional airlines and molding them into TWA. The idea of building a, an, air, a, an, an airline like TWA into a nationwide and then international carrier was one of Hughes' goals from the early, uh, from the 1930s on. And he had been instrumental in TWA's growth. Uh, he and another fellow had helped design one of the great uh, propeller-driven passenger planes of all time, the Constellation which remains to this day. None of, none of the current generation has probably ever even seen a Constellation, but the Constellation is one of the most gorgeous airplanes ever built with its three tails, and, and it revolutionized air travel at the time. At Los Angeles, passengers go aboard for a sky voyage that begins a new airline schedule of daily, non-stop, coast-to-coast -coast flights by Constellation planes. The pilot is Howard Hughes of Round the World fame. With war underway in Europe in 1939, Hughes began work on the D-2, a medium-range bomber. After three years of development, the military rejected the plane. And ironically, some people believe the Japanese adapted the design to build their famous Zero fighter plane. The amphibious Sikorsky S-43 was another of Hughes' pet projects at this time as German U-boats took their toll on Allied shipping lines, industrialist Henry J. Kaiser proposed the idea of a giant flying boat to President Roosevelt to ferry men and material across the ocean. Kaiser was a shipbuilder, not an airplane maker, and so he turned to Howard Hughes for assistance with the project. Hughes hired PR men like John Meyer to grease wheels in the nation's capital. But he realized you had to make campaign contributions you had to hire people who knew politicians, who knew the Washington power structure. So throughout his life, he basically had lawyers or public relations people who had connections to that structure, or in whatever state he was operating, had connections to that power structure in order to make sure that there was no regulatory interference. If he wanted to buy an airline, if he wanted to expand the route system of his airline, if he wanted to make an acquisition that might be controversial, he knew the benefit of having those kinds of people but the fact is there was this other darker side to his being which was then beginning to accelerate into the kind of recluse that we saw by the end of his life. 
The pressures from his many projects caused Hughes to suffer his first nervous breakdown in August of 1944. One of the uh, characteristics of Howard Hughes is when he became overstressed, he had to get away from it. And flying served that purpose. When you fly, you tend to be alone. You tend to go off all by yourself. Nobody can get to you. You can't get telephone calls, and no one can knock on the door and, and bother you. And what he did was simply get in a plane and fly away. Uh, he spent months simply uh, uh, flying around the Southwest. He'd make touch-and-go landings all day long, and then stay overnight or two or three nights in a motel room where he would just uh, turn off all the lights and sit in a darkened room, sometimes for two or three days. And throughout that whole period, it seemed that he was protecting himself. You know, the word asylum means a place of protection, and he was making for himself an asylum, a way that he could get away from stress and human contact. In 1946, Hughes was back in the saddle, this time in the FX-11, his design for a reconnaissance plane. In a test flight, one of the propellers lost oil and reversed its pitch. Hughes was nearly killed when the plane crashed into a house. While recovering, he became addicted to codeine and would never shake that addiction. To hide the scars on his face, he grew a mustache. Only months after his near-fatal crash, Howard Hughes took up his FX-11 to show the world he was still an airman. That done, it was time to face the biggest challenge of his aviation career the Flying Boat Project. People who worked on it called it Hercules, but to the American public, it was the spruce goose, made of wood because metal was in short supply. With a wingspan longer than a football field, this was an airship well suited to the dreamer in Howard Hughes. And for this maverick tycoon and his seat of the pants company to guide the spruce goose from drawing board to launch in less than three years, has to rank as one of the great dare-to-do-it stories in American enterprise. By the time the plane was finished, World War II was over. But that didn't keep Senator Ralph Brewster, who was investigating waste and corruption in the defense industry, from targeting Hughes and his Hercules project. Now, Senator Brewster's story, as related here yesterday, is a pack of lies and I can tear it apart if allowed to cross-question him. And it is unfair to place me in the position of having my integrity questioned and not being allowed to cross-examine Senator Brewster. All right. You... Yesterday, you told me I would be accorded the same privilege as the senator from Maine or anyone else here. Now, will you give me the questions in advance that you want to ask me while I am here? Or will you give them to any third neutral party? Is it not true that you are going to propound the questions for me as I testify and based upon what I testify as I go along? Are you willing to uh, set aside Hughes, the questions uh, in advance which you will ask me? Mr. Hughes. Whenever he was badgered by the committee, Hughes stood his ground and seemed to gain the upper hand as the hearings continued. Uh, allow Mr. Hughes. I'm asking you what your answer was. And we're not going to have this bickering back and forth. You are before this committee, and you're going to answer the question. You asked me just now uh, about a reply that I made. My answer is I don't remember. Now, the man is well, taking down... Well, I'll ask you again. What? Will you bring Mr. Mars in at the 2 o'clock session? Uh, I... No, I don't think I will. Will you try to bring him in? No, I don't think I'll try. During a break in the hearings, Hughes ordered the spruce goose towed from its hangar with the intention of settling things for good. He invited his hydraulic engineer to be his co-pilot on the flight. Okay, at that time, our chief engineer, who later on became general manager, was Ray Hopper, who was my boss. And Ray came into my office, and uh, he said, uh, Howard wants you to be the co-pilot on the flight. I said, why? <laughs> He said, uh, I don't know, he just wants you to be. And I said, does he know I don't fly? And uh, he said, yeah, maybe that's why he wants you. A successful flight of the Hercules would pull the rug out from under the Senate Committee's questioning of the project. 
As it happened, the plane was airborne for just one mile on that day before Hughes set it down again in Long Beach Harbor. But the flight proved the Spruce Goose, three times heavier than any plane ever built, was indeed a boat that could fly. After the historic flight, Hughes confounded the critics even further. Instead of handing the plane over to the government, he exercised his option to lease it. He would keep the Spruce Goose in air-conditioned storage for the rest of his life at a cost to him of a million dollars a year. As controversial as this airplane was Hughes's 1946 movie starring sexy new Discovery Jane Russell on billboards across the country. Howard's first new film in a decade provoked so many disputes with censors, its release was delayed four years. Rumors of steamy love scenes guaranteed its success at the box office anyway, as Hughes had anticipated. What's your name? Real. What's the rest of it? McDonald's. McDonald's. In the movie, The Outlaw, the public still got more than the censors bargained for. There was cleavage in it. And of course, in those days, you didn't show any cleavage at all. And it was, uh, I remember the shot they got, as a matter of fact, and it was uh, not even supposed to be in there because it was an accident. It was, a, there was a, the bed and Billy the Kid was lying on the bed and I was, the camera was right across from me and I leaned over this way. I had a blouse on that went like so. And I leaned over to pull the covers up, and they got too much cleavage. Be careful, your wound, you'll hurt yourself. That's right, I remember now. I caught one yesterday, didn't I? Yesterday. It was a month ago. You've been terribly sick. Hughes had more substance than the typical Hollywood playboy. But in the late 1940s, that seemed his role, as he dated stars like Ava Gardner and Lana Turner. Those relationships with the uh, women around his age were a brief period of time, four, five, six years, that he was involved with women his own age and who were famous actresses. The women throughout most of the remainder of that period were very, very young. They were starlets or aspiring starlets, uh, usually in their teens. The older he got, the younger the women got. Hughes thought nothing of placing women under contract to his production company, even when he lacked a movie for them to act in. His relationship lasted five years with young Terry Moore, but most of the liaisons were brief and superficial. Howard brought a lot of girls from all over and put them under contract, and he had agents uh, who worked for him, and a lot of people full-time, who were going around the world, or they'd see a picture, let's say, of Gina Lola Bridget on Life magazine, uh, they would show it to him or he would see it and say, I want to, you know, see this girl. And he, he had photographers working full time for them and they had to take shots of these girls from every angle without makeup. They were not allowed to wear makeup because he wanted to be sure they were a true beauty and not a false beauty. To build a stronger base in the movie business, Hughes spent $9 million in 1948 to buy RKO Studios. But he interfered in so many projects, the studio lost most of its key employees. It lost more when Hughes suddenly fired 100 workers on grounds that they were communists. He refused to list screenwriter Paul Jericho in a movie's credits for the same reason. He even appeared in court the last time he would do so to denounce the writer. In Korea, American troops were fighting more tangible forms of communism, and Hughes Aircraft supplied the choppers. The aircraft producer unveils his monster helicopter to the public and Air Force officers at Culver City, California. Powered by turbojet motors, the huge copter is designed primarily to lift great weights. It is the largest aircraft of its kind known, and when perfected, it is expected to take off and carry the load of a small freight car, and in passenger models, upwards of 100 persons. The copter itself weighs 40,000 pounds, and its rotating blades measure 125 feet from tip to tip. Las Vegas of the 1950s was a boom town of interest to Howard Hughes, but beneath its glitz and glamour, he was becoming more a recluse. 
His business instincts remained sharp, though, as did his belief that charity begins at home. And in 1953, he established the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute ultimately took control of Hughes Aircraft Company, owned the entire company. It was an unusual charity in the sense that it began, began its life uh, with a debt and didn't begin with any assets. And ultimately, through the years, Hughes Air, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which was created in theory to fund medical research, returned more money to Howard Hughes, the person, than it spent on medical research. Hughes now prowled casinos along the Strip in Las Vegas for female company, using underlings to obtain signed releases that the women wouldn't talk to the media. The fear of infectious disease instilled in him by his mother long ago now bore its singular fruit. Pretty soon he got to the point where he would demand that everything that uh, was handed to him be handed to him with layers of uh, paper towels or Kleenex around it. That his employees even who were typing notes about meetings that he attended, maybe notes that he'd never see, but they had to wear white gloves. He had people scrubbing and washing everything that he would ever have to touch and even began himself to scrub and wash with Kleenex everything that he touched um, to protect himself. Hughes kept his hand in Hollywood in the 1950s with movies like The French Line and a typical Howard Hughes way to publicize the star attraction. To Hughes, protests from church groups only meant improved receipts at the box office. Another of his movies came with scandal built in when director Roberto Rossellini fell in love with leading lady Ingrid Bergman in an affair considered notorious for the time. The suggestive volcano erupting poster that Hughes came up with was pulled by censors. The Conqueror was an epic starring Susan Hayward and one of Howard Hughes' favorite actors, John Wayne. The sets were often lavish in a Hughes movie, and the action usually more important than artistic merit. Another movie starring John Wayne began production in 1949 and was not released until 1957 because Hughes spent so much time editing and re-editing the flying scenes. By the time it reached the theaters, the jets shown in it were obsolete. Who was she, this girl who could handle a jet or an embrace with equal ease? In 1957, Hughes married Jean Peters, an on and off friend of some years. Some saw this as his tactic to prevent others from having him declared mentally incompetent. His biographer, Donald Steele, relates the fiasco his meddling caused at TWA. Transworld Airlines had to buy a jet fleet in the 19, late 1950s. And to, to finance that jet fleet, which was going to be several hundred millions of dollars, even Howard Hughes did not have that kind of money. And so it was trying to deal with that dilemma, how to come up with the money versus not surrendering any control that eventually was to almost destroy TWA and mentally uh, really brought on his second major mental collapse. A bizarre sequence of events now occurred as Hughes checked into the Beverly Hills Hotel. From his rented bungalow, he called Noah Dietrich, made him come to the hotel for a meeting and then dispatched him to Houston with orders to increase profits at Hughes Tool Company. Then Hughes telephoned his Mormon aide, Bill Gay, and announced he was firing Dietrich, his associate of 30 years. He left Los Angeles for Montreal, and he became a kind of frequent flyer run amok in a cruel parody of the historic flights he had made years before. After a period in Montreal, he flew to the Bahamas. The need to escape business problems and people conflicts led him on a quixotic search for sanctuary. But in the Bahamas, he suffered another nervous collapse. Six months later, Hughes resurfaced and flew back to California. He moved into Rancho Santa Fe with wife Jean Peters, ready to start another unpredictable chapter in his life. In 1960, Howard Hughes was forced to borrow $265 million. With the deal, he lost control of the airline he had owned for 15 years. The stress of this period is visible in the last known photograph of Hughes, taken in 1961.
On the heels of that loss, Hughes made a lowball estimate to produce helicopters, costing Hughes aircraft $90 million. In 1966, Hughes boarded a train in Los Angeles, the first time he had ventured out of the house in four and a half years. He headed east on another of his journeys that was part escape, part search. After staying four months at the Ritz-Carlton in Boston, he packed his bags for Las Vegas. By this time, he was estranged from his wife and from everybody else. He began to show worrisome personal traits, such as refusing to bathe or even wear clothes for days at a time. Taking the penthouse floor of the Desert Inn, Hughes embarked on a buying spree of local properties. He broke contact with his Los Angeles office as he found a fresh lease on business life in the desert. He hired a new right-hand man, Bob Mayhew, who, strangely enough, would never meet his boss face to face. In just a year, Hughes spent $65 million acquiring various casinos, two small airlines, and the local TV station. Then Gene Peters filed for divorce and received 20 years of alimony payment in return for silence. Bob Mayhew lost his perks when Hughes fired him. This is so unlike Mr. Hughes. I have known him to be a very compassionate man. We have had such an unusually excellent relationship. I have represented him at high levels. I have carried on very responsible assignments for him. My relationship, unfortunately, it appears, was always with, well, or has been rather, for the last eight years directly with him. But you never met him. That is correct. I have seen him. That's rather unusual for a business relationship. It, it is not unusual in the Hughes world. Now, Hughes decided to quit Las Vegas. A rare checkup showed he was suffering from kidney disease and codeine and Valium abuse. That didn't prevent his departure for the Bahamas. In 1972, the biggest publishing hoax of the century was almost pulled off by Clifford Irving, who professed to be Howard Hughes' official biographer. Much of his book was obtained from manuscript of my book. A great deal of it. Irving denied all charges, but Hughes was yet to be heard from. Uh, everyone believed that these were valid interviews. He knew that they were a fraud, fraud and so did all of his staff, because he had never met Clifford Irving. And no one would believe it until he spoke publicly. So he, he had to come forth and speak. Uh, he talked on the telephone to uh, a number of interviewers. And it, it, again, was an example of how he could pull himself together uh, remarkably for brief periods of time. This is uh, supposedly testimony before a federal grand jury in Miami in which you were described as uh, being, uh, it would be in December 1970. Oh, you mean the 97 pound uh, uh, waste lake beard? So not, not, not 97, uh, Mr. Hughes, uh, just a second. It says you were a six foot tall man weighing only 94 pounds with a beard to his chest hair to the middle of his back, and fingernails and toenails from six to eight inches long. Well, the statistics are that I am six feet three and three quarters inches, which is what I've always been. Uh, just barely under six feet four. And uh, as I would get in the 140 to 50 area, I am thin, I've always been thin. Uh, and uh, what was the other statistics? Uh, toenails. Yeah, the toenails, six to uh, eight inches long. Well, this is uh, just inconceivable. If I had toenails eight inches long, I couldn't walk. Fingernails <laughs> <laughs> eight inches long, I couldn't write my name. That was the one thing that, uh, that was the first means of disproving it that uh, came to my mind. We have heard that recording many times, and anybody who's heard it thinks you're, you're listening to a man who's absolutely lucid, complete possession of his faculties. And even when he's asked questions about the allegedly the long toenails and the long hair and the unkempt appearance, the way he chuckles and, and sloughs that off, it's with such a confidence and ease, you can't believe, listening to that, that it isn't true. 
But it wasn't true, because uh, one of the things we came across were logs, uh, in, in, entries by the aides who were taking care of him that showed his activities minute by minute right around that time. And he was the absolute opposite of the assured and uh, self-possessed individual that you heard on that, that phone conversation. Hughes was prevented from meeting people as TV producer Don Hewitt of 60 Minutes fame found out when he tried to make contact in 1972. I was here about 20 minutes before the guard who was on duty phoned another guard who came up and, and told me, he said, uh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I was curious about Mr. Hughes. He said, why are you curious about Mr. Hughes? I said, well, isn't the whole world curious about Mr. Hughes? He said, well, you'll have to get out of here. During his last extended odyssey, Hughes was never seen in public. But one day, he broke out of his 15-year isolation after relocating to Nicaragua. Improbably enough, it occurred in the capital city of Managua when he agreed to sit down with General Somoza. The dictator never guessed this was now a man who routinely went half-naked and lived on chocolate bars and bottled water. But as one newspaper showed, Hughes knew enough to clean up his act for a state occasion. Uh, he said that uh, this was the first time that he had talked to somebody outside of his small circle of men who run his economic empire. And after talking with me, he felt very well. The therapy from Samosa was short-lived as Hughes next headed for Canada where he lived in a darkened room of the Bayshore Inn in Vancouver. After five months in Canada, Hughes, now desperately ill, returned to Managua. Here, he languished into a childlike and premature old age. The medium he had loved and worked in became a comfort as he watched the same favorite movies over and over again. A trip to England coincided with a renewed interest in flying, but one day Hughes fell and broke his hip and the accident triggered his final decline. He seemed to perform a kind of mental maneuver that said, germs that come from other people are dangerous. Germs that come from me are not dangerous. And he was very extreme about this. I mean, bathing was something that didn't go on even once a year. Uh, shampooing his hair was something that didn't even go on once a year. Brushing his teeth was unheard of. Uh, his teeth simply rotted away because he never touched them with a toothbrush. He seemed very, it seemed very aversive to him to even clean himself in any way, and he resisted this as much as he possibly could. Logs kept by his orderlies show how often he rested during the day and identify his reliance on BBs or blue bombers for the doses of Valium he needed to sleep. The particulars of Hughes' sedentary and sometimes sordid existence at this time are well documented. Harder to grasp is what was going on inside that once agile mind and powerful imagination. The conceiver of innovative airplanes, romantic movies, and flying boats. In 1973, Hughes was transported from London back to the Bahamas as grand jury indictments, corporate lawsuits, and tabloid rumors all but destroyed his reputation. Another move to Acapulco couldn't hide the fact that the achievements of a lifetime were now lost in a puzzling caricature created in part by the hand of Howard Hughes. The master of publicity was now its victim and he would never again enjoy any of the limelight or luxury he could afford. When he was near death, it was decided to fly Hughes to his hometown in Texas, a place he had avoided ever since the 1930s. He managed to avoid it this time, too. As we uh, were taxiing into the customs ramp, the uh, doctor in the back said, just take your time, there's no need to hurry any longer. That's how we knew at that time. He uh, died apparently as we were descending into Houston, just as we were coming and approaching the airport. With Howard Hughes, even death could not be taken for granted. Fingerprints were taken and are being sent to the FBI for a confirmation of identity. The preliminary autopsy findings demonstrated that Mr. Hughes died of chronic renal disease. 
In addition to the kidney failure, x-rays revealed there were stubs of broken drug needles still in Hughes' body. Howard Hughes was buried on April 7, 1976. About 20 relatives gathered to hear a minister read from the book of John. We brought nothing into the world, and it is certain we will take nothing out. And that was the problem. Who was the rightful heir to the incredible fortune Howard Hughes left behind? One will, later proved bogus, awarded a 16th of the Hughes estate to Melvin Dumar, a gas station attendant later depicted in a film by Jonathan Demme. I went around and I applied for a job at a place like uh, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop, Hughes. Well, what happened there? They didn't want me. What a shame. How come you keep saying that? What a shame. Well, I might have done something. Like what? I'm Howard Hughes. One of the fascinating things I think preoccupied people so much about Hughes after he died was the question of his will. Who would get the money? Who did he leave it to? And they couldn't imagine somebody with that kind of wealth and that influence and that far reaching an empire not having a will. But we were absolutely convinced that he did not have a will, uh, at least a valid will at that time. And I think the courts have so basically ruled in terms of the way the estate was later distributed to the heirs. And the reason for that was very simple. Hughes got to the point in his life where he thought signing a will was in somehow or another uh, ending his own life. I mean, that may seem like a dramatic statement, but he constantly used the will or the notion of being able to distribute some of those riches to others as a way to get people to do things for him. He was always telling those around him, well, you know, you're in my will. It's possible to speculate on why this man of action and adventure and of so many different guises did what he did and in such controversial fashion and how it might have all come out differently. I thought here was a man that just needed some tender loving care. How very sad that this man who had everything in the world but love at that time that anyone who cared about him was kept away. But no one can change a life hell-bent on making itself. Howard Hughes chartered a flight through our time uniquely his own. <laughs>